The date was the 21st of December 1979. The Lancaster House Agreement had just been signed and the Rhodesian Bush War, also known as the Zimbabwe War of Liberation, was officially brought to an end. One of the signatories at the table was a man who was the very embodiment of the struggle against the Rhodesian government. The man who had been arrested and imprisoned for his political dissidence and had risked his life in pursuit of the liberation of his people would soon become the most powerful man in the country he had spent most of his working life fighting for. That man was Robert Gabriel Mugabe. To some, Mugabe will forever be remembered as a freedom fighter who fought against the racist regime and liberated his people from colonial oppression. But to others, Mugabe was a brutal dictator responsible for running his country's economy to the ground through white girl corruption, mismanagement and human rights abuses. Born in a small town in what was then known as the British colony of Southern Rhodesia, Robert Mugabe was the fourth of six children. His voracious appetite for learning and his sharp mind would win him a scholarship to study at the University of Fort Hare in South Africa. It was here that a young Mugabe would join the ANC Youth League and be introduced to his guiding political philosophy of Marxist-Leninism. Upon graduation, Mugabe would begin his career as a teacher in Northern Rhodesia before moving over to teach in Ghana where he would meet his first wife, Sally Hayfron. While in Ghana, Mugabe would become a big believer in the revolutionary ideas of Ghana's first president, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, and his brand of African socialism. Putting his newfound faith into practice, Mugabe would return to join the growing black nationalist movement in his home country, which was led by the charismatic Joshua Nkomo and his National Democratic Party. Immediately recognizing Mugabe's potential, Nkomo appointed Mugabe to a prominent position within the NDP, and although both men shared the same dream of one day seizing power from the white minority government, which had controlled the country since its establishment as a colony in 1923, ideological and ethnic differences between the two men would create a lifelong rift between them. Continuous infighting combined with the declaration of illegality by the Rhodesian government would bring an end to the NDP, and its members would split to form two new black nationalist movements. The first, was the Zimbabwe African People's Union, or ZAPU, which was led by Joshua Nkomo, and the second was the more radical Zimbabwe African National Union, or ZANU, which was led by the Reverend Indabaningi Sithole. The growing black nationalist movement led by the likes of Nkomo, Mugabe, and Sithole would strike fear into the hearts of the white population, most of whom would rally behind the right-wing Rhodesian front of Winston Field and Ian Smith. With most of the black population still unable to vote, the Rhodesian Front would win the December 1962 election on the back of a campaign that promised the continuation of white minority rule in southern Rhodesia and the achievement of full independence from Great Britain. The new government would grow increasingly wary of Mugabe and his party members and in 1964, Mugabe and Sethole would be imprisoned for sedition. Mugabe's time in prison would be made even worse after he received news that his three-year-old son had died of an illness in Ghana and he wouldn't be allowed to attend his funeral. But even in prison, Mugabe would continue on his life's mission. He would acquire a master's degree in economics, two law degrees, and also become the leader of the ZANU movement after the Reverend Sitole was accused of cooperating with the white authorities in exchange for prison privileges. While Mugabe and his colleagues were in prison, the Rhodesian government led by Prime Minister Ian Smith would declare the independence of Southern Rhodesia from Great Britain and rename the country Rhodesia. Rhodesia's declaration of independence was rejected by Britain and its allies and sanctions were imposed on the Rhodesian government. This declaration would ultimately set the scene for the Rhodesian Bush War which would rage on for the next 15 years as the black nationalists refused to submit to the government of Ian Smith and its insistence on white minority rule. Upon his release from prison in 1974, Mugabe would flee to Mozambique where he would join the Zimbabwe Africa National Liberation Army, which had been set up as the military arm of the ZANU movement. The Chinese-backed Zanla forces would form an arms-length coalition with the Soviet-sponsored Zimbabwe People's Revolutionary Army, which was the military wing of Nkomo's ZAPO movement. This shaky coalition would be known as the Patriotic Front, and their joint objectives would be to bring down the Rhodesian white minority government, establish an independent state which was ruled by the black majority, 
and repatriate to the black population the thousands of acres of land now owned by a Rhodesia's population of white commercial farmers. The Rhodesian bush war would claim the lives of over 1,000 Rhodesian fighters, 10,000 patriotic front militias, and 20,000 civilians. The fighting would eventually be brought to an end with the signing of the Lancaster House Agreement in which all parties agreed a ceasefire and Rhodesia's unilateral declaration of independence was effectively nullified. This agreement would serve as the roadmap for the creation of the independent nation of Zimbabwe which would be ruled by the black majority. The agreement would nevertheless ensure that the white minority would continue to enjoy many of their economic and political privileges. 20 seats would be reserved for white legislators in the country's new parliament and the protection of the white community's farmlands and properties would be guaranteed in exchange for a commitment from the UK and US governments to provide the required financial assistance that would enable the Zimbabwean government to gradually purchase land from the white community that would be redistributed to landless black Zimbabweans. With the agreement signed, the country was temporarily returned to British control pending the conclusion of the very first elections in which the entire population would be allowed to vote regardless of race or class. And after a very rocky election season with reports of widespread voter intimidation and two assassination attempts, Robert Mugabe was elected as the first Prime Minister of the newly independent Republic of Zimbabwe as the ZANU Party won 37 more seats than Nkomo's ZAPU Party. Mugabe's first actions as Prime Minister would be aimed at decolonizing the minds of the black population by means of a complete rebranding of the country. His government would remove all statues and references to Rhodesia's colonial founder Cecil Rhodes. The names of several cities would also be changed, the most prominent of which was the Rhodesian capital of Salisbury which would now be known as the Zimbabwean capital of Harare. For the most part, the early years of Mugabe's regime would see him praised in the international media and receive the support of Western governments in the form of development aid. Pursuing a policy of reconciliation, he would appoint two white ministers into his government and in a 1981 address, he was recorded as saying, If yesterday I fought you as an enemy, today you have become a friend. If yesterday you hated me, today you cannot avoid the love that binds me to you. British Foreign Secretary Lord Carrington would even put his name forward for a Nobel Peace Prize nomination in recognition of his efforts to bring about the Rhodesian peace settlement. Despite initially suggesting that Zimbabwe would be converted into a Soviet-style socialist state with a centralized economy, Mugabe was keen to prevent a full-scale white exodus which he recognized would most likely cripple his nation's economy. In sharp contrast to his Marxist rhetoric, his government's budgetary policies would be surprisingly conservative and Zimbabwe would remain a market economy for all intents and purposes. Mugabe would nevertheless invest heavily in providing free education and healthcare to the general population and in the first 20 years under Mugabe, Zimbabwe's infant immunization rates would rise from 25% to 92% and its literacy rates would rise from 62% to 82%, a record that very few African leaders could compete with. With the help of the British government, Mugabe's regime would also resettle over 50,000 black families on land that was purchased from white commercial farmers. But regardless of his early successes, Mugabe's reputation as a progressive visionary leader would slowly but surely begin to be tarnished. Despite their joint success in the fight for Zimbabwe's independence, ideological differences combined with Mugabe's general distrust of Joshua Nkomo and his Ndebele tribesmen will see Mugabe begin plotting to suppress Nkomo and his supporters. Keeping his enemies close, Mugabe would appoint Nkomo into the toothless bulldog role of Minister of Home Affairs and would also appoint other key Zappo members into similarly high sounding but powerless positions within his cabinet. However, the Cold War that had been brewing between Mugabe and Nkomo would eventually spring to life after a stash of weapons and ammunition were found on Zapu owned farmlands. Accusing Nkomo of plotting a coup d'etat, Mugabe would be quoted as saying, Zapu and its leader Dr. Joshua Nkomo are like a cobra in a house, and the only way to deal effectively with a snake is to strike and destroy its head. And strike he did. Taking swift action, Mugabe would unleash his notorious 5th Brigade on Nkomo's native Mathebele land in a violent campaign known as Operation Gukurahundi. Thousands of Ndebele civilians would be accused of treason, tortured and killed as Mugabe attempted to destroy the Zapu party once and for all and convert Zimbabwe into a one-party state. The Gukurahundi campaign 
would see widespread suppression of all Nkobo loyalists in a strong wave of violence that would strike fear into the hearts of all of Mugabe's rivals. Mugabe's brutal Gokorohondi campaign would severely weaken the Zapu party, and by 1987, Mugabe would move to consolidate power even further as he successfully merged what was left of Nkomo's Zapu party to his Zanu party. And with the Zanu party's increased voting power in the Zimbabwean parliament, Mugabe would successfully push for a constitutional amendment that would elevate him to the new role of executive president. This new office would make Mugabe the head of state, the head of government, and the commander-in-chief of the armed forces. The reforms would also get rid of electoral term limits and grant Mugabe the ability to declare martial law. This move would mark the beginning of his transformation from public servant and democrat to Zimbabwe's all-powerful supreme leader. The late 80s and early 90s would see the emergence of a new political elite. Mugabe's high-flying ZANU loyalists would flaunt their wealth and status by purchasing large houses and flashy cars and sending their children to private schools. One of the primary sources of their wealth would come from the acquisitions of lucrative commercial farmlands which, contrary to the terms of the Lancaster House Agreement, would be expropriated from white farmers at fixed prices, as opposed to the willing buyer-willing seller principle which the parties originally agreed to back in 1979. In an attempt to curb the excesses of his comrades, Mugabe would be forced to declare prohibition on all senior government officials which would prevent them from having more than one salary or owning more than 50 acres of agricultural land. But as Mugabe and his inner circle were getting richer and more powerful, the black population was getting poorer and more disillusioned. By the end of the 1990s, Zimbabwe's economy had declined to the point that many black Zimbabweans were arguably worse off than they were prior to independence. Life expectancy was dropping, real wages were much lower, and unemployment was on the rise. Feeling cornered, Mugabe would increasingly begin to blame the country's economic woes on Western interference as well as the white Zimbabwean minority which despite his government's land expropriation policies, still controlled Zimbabwe's agricultural and manufacturing industries. Mugabe's rhetoric would become increasingly aggressive, and on one occasion, he will be quoted as calling on his supporters to strike fear into the hearts of the white man, who according to him, was the real enemy. He would also continually accuse his black detractors of being political stooges and sellouts. By the time of the crossover into the new millennium, the Mugabe regime would find itself under even more pressure as a new wave of young city-dwelling Zimbabweans began to call for change. This was a generation of Zimbabweans who were born after the War of Liberation and while they were very grateful for Mugabe's efforts to bring about political freedom, what really mattered to them was economic freedom. The emergence of this generation would see the ZANU party begin to lose its foothold in urban areas and Mugabe would find himself increasingly needing to seek the support of the rural population. Determined to stay in power and energize his base, Mugabe would constantly resort to his tried and tested revolutionary rhetoric and attempt to convince the rural population that all of their problems were due to the white minority's occupation of their ancestral lands and a global conspiracy by racist foreign powers to sabotage his government. Zimbabwe's elections of the year 2000 would be the most momentous since the country's first elections back in 1980. And although Mugabe's Zanu party would ultimately win the election, the movement for democratic change, led by Morgan Tsangarai, would mount a major challenge to ZANU's dominance, winning a total of 57 out of 120 seats. While still strategizing on how to deal with the rising threat posed by Tsangarai's MDC party, Mugabe would be faced with another problem. The war veterans of the Zimbabwe War of Liberation, who had found their pension funds embezzled by corrupt officials, would take matters into their own hands by organizing violent attacks on white farmers and taking over their commercial farms. Not wanting to waste a golden opportunity to regain the support of an increasingly disgruntled and disillusioned black population, Mugabe would approve of the takeovers as it would not only help provide a temporary solution to the pension problem, but would also help galvanize his rural supporters, to whom he would once again be able to project himself as a revolutionary hero. The papers in Britain all expected me to say 
uh, something and uh, to say to uh, order the war veterans out. I said I will not do that at all. Uh. To the likes of Ian e. Smith. Ian e. Smith's farm to date has not been designated because it lies, I take it, in an area where, and in circumstances uh, in which uh, it's, it's not possible to designate it. But if we had decided to be arbitrary, who would have seized that land? And not only seized the land, but seized the person as well. spotted us, they chased after us, they shot at us in Mariwa twice. We went to the police station to hopefully uh, find ourselves in a safe position, but within about 15 minutes the um, war vets invaded the place, they, they, they just walked into the police camp, some of them were armed, and they picked up the three of us that were there. Uh, they then took us to the war vet headquarters in Moroa. They gave me a good hiding. I lost sight of the others then. And I was chucked into a room where Dave Stevens was. Um, we were given another hiding inside the room. Then we were taken out to a private sedan vehicle, um, taken outside of Moroa, where they again beat us up. A woman intervened on my behalf, saying that she knew who I was and I shouldn't um, be treated like this, basically. And there was another young guy there who also knew me. Um, he said, he stuck up for me. Um, so they threw me into the car and then they took David Stevens around the back. And they beat him up very badly and then they shot him. Yeah. I, I certainly believe that the responsibility of the current state of affairs lies squarely on President Mugabe himself. Because when the farm invasions were first undertaken as part of his plan, um, he was publicly condoning lawlessness and anarchy. Uh, he was disregarding court rulings. He was uh, instructing the police to keep off. And of course, when a bunch of uh, bandits with no defined leadership, with no defined responsibility go out in the countryside, they are bound to engage in lawless activities. And this is what has now come to pass. Uh, it's a very shattering experience that people are getting killed. Some of, some of the people are very close to me, uh, black and white. So it is not just about a particular race. This is not a race war. So to conclude that there is going to be civil war, I think it is exaggerating the current state of affairs. By targeting white farmers, by targeting the racist, uh, the race, by promoting the racist angle, he is hoping that the whole nation will support him on this dangerous path. Unfortunately, the people of Zimbabwe uh, don't see this as a racist issue. They see this as a, a political opportunism on the part of Mugabe to try to raise the land issue at the next elections. And yet he had 20 years to resolve this issue. So people have seen through the whole strategy. That's why he's very disappointed. Riding the wave of the Zimbabwean zeitgeist, Mugabe would take things one step further by issuing a presidential decree giving his government the legal right to seize white-owned farms without compensation. By this point, Mugabe's once cordial relationship with the British government had completely broken down and acting contrary to the UK's commitments under the Lancaster House Agreement, British Prime Minister Tony Blair had stopped providing the Zimbabwean government with the necessary financial support that would have enabled the Mugabe regime to purchase land from the white community. With the British government no longer fulfilling its side of the bargain, Mugabe felt completely justified in simply seizing land and directing the white landowners to seek compensation from Mr Blair's government. 
When challenged by the Zimbabwean judiciary on the legality of his actions, Mugabe will be quoted as saying, The court can do whatever they want, but no judicial decision would stand in our way. My own position is that we should not even be defending our position in the courts. The country is our country, and this land is our land. They think because they are white, they have a divine right to our resources. Not here. The white man is not indigenous to Africa. Africa is for Africans, and Zimbabwe is for Zimbabweans. After successfully maneuvering its way around the judicial challenge, the Mugabe regime would begin indiscriminately seizing white-owned commercial farmlands without compensation. But despite the many promises of a bright new dawn and prosperity for all black Zimbabweans, the farm seizures would wreak havoc on Zimbabwe's economy. A large number of the seized farmlands would be left unoccupied, while many others were distributed to peasant farmers and close associates of the Mugabe regime who would be unable to maintain the same levels of productivity due to inexperience, lack of equipment, and in some cases, lack of interest. By the year 2008, corn production had dropped from 2 million tons to approximately 450,000 tons, and a food crisis would grip the nation which was once referred to as the breadbasket of Africa. An estimated 75% of Zimbabwe's population would find itself relying on food aid as Zimbabwe's GDP dropped by nearly 50%. The Mugabe regime, now heavily in debt due to his reduced tax revenue and his costly involvement in the Congolese civil war, would begin a rollout of an unprecedented series of quantitative easing measures that would see the Zimbabwean dollar crash in 2007 as the country recorded an inflation rate of over 7,600%. By the very next year, the inflation rate had reached a staggering 250 million percent, with a loaf of bread costing about a third of the average daily wage and most Zimbabweans unable to pay their rent. The unemployment rate would rise to over 80% and life expectancy would drop to as low as 34 for women and 36 for men, a sharp drop from the 1997 figures of 63 and 54 respectively. But even with the economy on its knees, Mugabe would nevertheless maneuver his way to winning two re-elections, firstly in 2008 and secondly in 2013 at the ripe old age of 89. And to the surprise of many, an increasingly feeble and senile Robert Mugabe would again state his intention to run for re-election in the 2018 general election, which would take place shortly after his 94th birthday. But unfortunately for him, Mugabe would make a major mistake in November 2017 when he sacked his vice president Emerson Manangagwa. This move would fuel speculation that Mugabe was about to name his very unpopular second wife Grace as his successor. Mugabe had married Grace back in 1996, a few years after the death of his first wife Sally Heyfron. In contrast to her predecessor, Grace Mugabe was very unpopular with the ZANU establishment as well as the general public who would dub her Gucci Grace thanks to her love for designer clothes and shopping sprees abroad. Unwilling to wait and see what would happen, Manangagwa loyalists would mobilize to place Robert Mugabe under house arrest and he would be sacked as the leader of the ZANU party with Manangagwa appointed in his place. Mugabe was then given an ultimatum to either resign or face impeachment. Mugabe initially refused to resign but as the impeachment proceedings began, he finally saw the writing on the wall and announced his resignation on the 20th of November 2017. After over 37 years in power, Mugabe's severance package would be reported as including full immunity from criminal prosecution, retention of all business interests acquired during his time in office, as well as a cash payment of at least $10 million. But within the space of two years, Mugabe would pass away in a Singaporean hospital at the grand old age of 95, leaving behind a legacy with more detractors than supporters. A full-blooded Marxist revolutionary who had faced prison and risked his own life in the fight for the independence of his nation, Mugabe's status as a revolutionary Hall of Famer is undisputable. His promotion of racial reconciliation in the early years of his administration would come a whole decade before Nelson Mandela espoused the same philosophy in post-apartheid South Africa. However, his addiction to power would ultimately prove to be his undoing. Although both Mandela and Mugabe were prisoners turned presidents, the big difference between the two men is that while Mandela stood down after one term in office, Mugabe would cling on to power until the bitter end. Today, Nelson Mandela is universally respected as an untainted hero, while Mugabe will unfortunately be remembered by many as an oppressor who turned one of the most promising African nations into a failing state and became the very embodiment of the thing he had spent most of his young life fighting against. 
tyranny. In the words of the great Nelson Mandela, the trouble with Mugabe is that he was the star, but then the sun came up. Once again, it's KB Tyro for New Africa. If you've enjoyed this video and would like to see more content like this, then please like and share this video and also consider supporting us on Patreon at www.patreon.com newafrica. Thanks again for all your support and until next time.